Good day. My name is David Wild, and this is part two of a three-part lecture on the history of management from Connect Master Management 2.0. Let's begin this part of our lecture talking about the scientific management perspective. Scholars developed the scientific management perspective to examine work tasks to identify changes that could be made in work methods or tools to increase employee productivity and their well-being. Let's first talk about Frederick Taylor. In 1911, Frederick W. Taylor published his famous work on scientific management. According to Taylor, it is possible to manage with a scientific approach. The underlying logic was not to rely on favoritism, tradition, rule of thumb, guesswork, or personal opinion, but to rely more extensively on proven fact and science in managerial decision-making. Based on his work with companies and as an outcome of his studies, Taylor art articulated four principles of scientific management. First, to de the development of a science to replace the old one-best-way knowledge of workers. Second, scientific selection, and then the progressive development of workers. Third, bringing together the science and the scientifically selected and trained workers. And lastly, dividing work into two great divisions, with one of these divisions deliberately handed over to individuals on the management side. In contrast to hiring employees and letting them figure out how to use tools to accomplish their work, Scientific management provided a basis for designing jobs and training and motivating employees to optimize their productivity and their well-being. Two contemporaries of Frederick Taylor were Lillian Moeller Gil Gilbreth and Frank Bunker Gilbreth, who conducted time and motion studies, fatigue studies, and work simplification studies to try to maximize efficiency which then would enhance employee performance and company profitability. Frank Gilbreth used a micro-motion technique where he took motion pictures of operations of a job and recorded the time for each operation. By breaking the job down into parts and identifying the most efficient approach, he was able to increase the efficiency of each job. In the process of this work, the Gilbreths coined the term Thurblig, Gilbreth spelled backward, except for the TH, to refer to between 15 and as many as 18 basic elements of human activity or movement. After Frank's death in 1924, Lillian continued their work for many years, focusing on the application of motion studies to industry, to rehabilitation of the disabled, and toward the elimination of fatigue. Given her sub substantive involvement in the blending of an engineering approach to organizational settings, Lillian Gilbreth has been referred to as the first lady of engineering and the first lady of management. And as an interesting factoid, their life and home life uh, was the basis of the Disney movies Cheaper by the Dozen. In summary, with a dramatic increase in factory production and new technologies, organizations had to lead a large number of people who used their own tools and performed work differently. Scientific management reflected an effort by leading thinkers of the time to take the guesswork, the bias, the favoritism, and traditions out of managing and replace them with scientific logic. This new approach involved studying work processes, workers, and various methods to identify the best way to do work and to maximize productivity. Now let's talk about the administrative and bureaucratic perspective. Compared to the bottom-up approach of scientific management that focused on how work was done, Scholars who adopted the administrative and bureaucratic perspective sought to understand and improve organizations from the top down by improving the structure and quality of the management functions. Max Weber. 
One of the most influential scholars of organizational studies in the 20th century was Max Weber, a German sociologist. With the growing presence of organizations in society, Weber sought to study organizations themselves, what they were, how they worked, and why they were set up the way they were. As you can see in figure two on your screen, Weber argued that there are three primary types of authority prevalent within organizations, traditional, charismatic, and rational legal. Under traditional authority, authority is owed to the person in a position of power because they have inherited the post rather than obeying rules. Under charismatic authority, authority is based on virtue of personal trust in a leader, heroism, or exemplary qualities of a leader. And finally, under rational legal authority, authority is based on law, the impersonal order of a person in a position of authority within the defined area of legitimate power. Although all three bases of authority may serve as the foundation of an administrative structure. In Weber's view, the rational legal authority basis is the most legitimate for optimal organizational operations and is based on seven fundamental characteristics. First, a continuous organization of official functions bound by rules. Second, a specified sphere of competence based on the principles of division of labor allocation of authority, and enforcements for role performance. Third, the organization of offices follows the principle of hierarchy. That is, each lower office is under the control and supervision of a higher one. Fourth, the rules that regulate the conduct of an office may be technical rules or norms with specialized training required for those in their roles. Fifth, Members of the administrative staff should be completely separated from ownership of the means of production or administration. Officials should not be owners of company property. Sixth, incumbents cannot use their office position for personal gain. And finally, number seven, administrative acts, decisions, and rules are formulated and recorded in writing even in cases where oral discussion is the rule or is even mandatory. And now let's shine a spotlight on Henry Fayol, Another leading figure of the administrative and bureaucratic perspective was Henry Fayol, a French industrialist and management scholar. In fact, Fayol is often referred to as a leader of contemporary management thinking. In particular, Fayol is remembered for articulating the primary functions that successful managers carry out in all types of organizations. These five functions include, number one, forecasting and planning, number two, organizing, number three, commanding, number four, coordinating and leading, and number five, controlling. There are 14 principles that Fayol believe managers should follow to be effective, which you can see in Table 1 on your screen. First, there is the, the division of labor. Work should be divided so individuals can produce more and better work with the same amount of effort. Authority. Managers should have the right to give orders with responsibility. Discipline. Manager, managers should have clear expectations and ensure obedience with those expectations. Unity of command. Employees should receive orders from only one supervisor. Unity of direction. A group or unit should have only one plan. Subordination of individual interest to the general interest. Interest of the organization should prevail over a single individual or a small group's personal interest. Remuneration of personnel. Pay should be fair for both the employee and the organization. Centralization. Find the optimal degree of central coordination for an organization's efforts. Scalar chain, or the line of authority. 
balance speed and communication across areas within the organization with lines of authority going up the chain of command. Order. Everyone and everything should have a place and be in its place. Equity. Employees should be treated in an equitable manner. Stability of tenure of personnel. Employees need time to learn their jobs, and longevity should be encouraged and rewarded. Initiative. Employees should be encouraged to propose actions in the organization's interest. And finally, esprit de corps. Employees and employers should work in harmony. So in summary, looking at the administrative and bureaucratic perspectives, workplace efficiency is a major step in the development of modern management, and administrative theorists focus their time and energy on the managers themselves. Proponents of the administrative and bureaucratic perspective sought to study organizations and to identify what types of managerial practices were most effective. Max Weber advanced the effective principles of modern-day bureaucracy, and Henry Fayol articulated 14 principles that are key aspects of effective management across many different situations. And with that, we end the second part of this three-part lecture on the history of management.